So because of the advancement of our investigative tools, we've come to realize that several groups that used to be placed together were not monophyletic. And as such, people are rethinking the whole way, uh, the whole way in which animals and plants, well, of living things were grouped, okay? And this has seriously, for instance, affected the nomenclature and the classification of plants, okay? Well, we're still doing quite well in animals, but all these are also likely to happen while we continue to explore uh, the diversity of various groups of organisms uh, with our investigative tools that get every day better and better. Each new edition of the International Code of uh, uh, Nomenclature would override uh, all the uh, earlier or the earlier editions and all the provision will be implemented all the way back to the time of Linnaeus. What are the principles of botanical nomenclature? The following would be those that will govern uh, botanical taxonomy. The first one is that the botanical nomenclature is independent of the zoological, bacteri bacteriological, and viral nomenclature. That was understood already with the animals we discussed a while ago. A botanical name is fixed to a taxon by a type. And as I said before, we shall talk again about types in a little while. This is almost invariably dry plant material and is usually deposited and preserved in a herbarium, although it may also be an image. Yes, the type for plants may also be some very nice uh, uh, graphs or uh, graphics of the uh, plant in question. A guiding principle in botanical nomenclature, again, is priority, okay? The first publication of a name for a taxon is the one that is often going to be accepted and used. The intent of the code is that each taxonomic group of plant has only one correct name, okay? And the names of taxa are altered as if they were Latin. The rules of nomenclature are retroactive except specifically specified by the code. Let's talk briefly about the official names of animals and plants. In botany, the name of the author of a species is part of the official name of the species. It is often abbreviated, however, not often accompanied, not accompanied by the year of publication. In zoology instead, the author's name is not considered an official part of the name, but is usually given a, uh, as a, biblo a bibliographic aid. And when given, it is often followed by the year of the publication. It is recommended that the author's name be written in full, except L, which stands for Linnaeus, and sometimes F, that will stand for Fabricius. The botanical type system. In botany, a type is either a specimen or an illustration. A specimen is a real plant or one or more plants or, or one or more parts of a plant or a lot of small plants. They are often, well, they are of course dead and kept safe and curated in a herbarium or the equivalent of all these for fungi. The International Code of Nomenclature provides a listing of the various ki types uh, of uh, kinds of type, and the most important of which are here, the holotype. What is a holotype? I may discuss that here so I don't have to talk about that again when I'm talking about animals, okay? But when the author of a description has some material in his hand, after he has done his description, he appoints one of the specimens to serve as the reference. The reference, and when you say reference, that will be a specimen that, to which all conflicts will be referred to, to serve, and actually that is the only specimen that is the name bearing for the whole species. What do I mean? If later on they found out that some other specimen was not the same as this, they will have to change the name of the other, not this one. 
it cannot change name. It is the name bearing specimen. And that specimen is called the holotype and is kept in a museum. And once the holotype has been appointed, the remainder of the type theory all become what we call paratypes. Everything that is left is called a paratype. In the case of animals, we shall do where we, we can, or we say we could talk about it here. In the case of animals, an individual of the opposite sex may be selected and appointed to serve as an allotype. That is not provided for in the rules of the International Code, but it is often the practice. Note, as said, one of the opposite sex, several people turn to think that it is a female. Several descriptions have been made on females, and as such, eventually when the males are found, an allotype can be appointed from it. Many descriptions on animals are made on males simply because males sometimes are extremely colorful and will display several features that may be very important for the diagnosis of a particular group, okay? But the holotype could be a female or a male. Sometimes also it is extremely difficult to identify females in several groups. We're going to briefly talk also about lectotype. In the case, the author of this description does not appoint or did not appoint a specimen to serve as a type, all the series become sin types, all of equivalent value. And then an author could subsequently pick one of them and erect it to serve as the reference, in which case that reference will be called electotype. Okay? Yes, electotype, and from which they could also pick an individual of the opposite sex, which we call an allo-electotype. We could also find ourselves in a catastrophic case where all the material of the original description is completely destroyed. And it's happened before, where a whole museum got burned and valuable specimens were all lost. Okay? In that case, someone else could set out to replace all these series, in which case he was going to appoint from them a new type to serve as reference and we also have the status and all the privileges attached to it. There are several other terms that we have, but all are not extreme, not as, are not as important as those we've mentioned before. The, whole, the zoological system, and there basically, we've mentioned, uh, we're mentioning some of those we've talked about, but one thing that is important for us, at least to mention here, which applies as well, as, uh, as well with Bonny is the notion of the type locality, which is the area where the type specimen was collected. It is often better to refer to it by providing uh, geographical coordinates, especially in a system where sometimes people decide to change the name of cities, it may become extremely confusing. I could become the president of this country and decide that Boya is going to be called Focamville, and then all the material that was based on Boya may not be found again if people come looking for Boya after several generations. But the geographical coordinates will remain the same and nobody can ever alter them. Okay? With the next slide. Now, we have also discussed all these holotype, paratype, allotype uh, in the, uh, while talking about plants. So we're going to move forward to discuss validity, okay? We are aware of all these things. What are we going to be considered to be valid? I want to say that Latin names, and of course we talk about the names of living organisms, okay? Latin names can be published or unpublished. They can be occupied. They could be nomen nudum, available, preoccupied, valid, invalid, or nomen dubium. And I'm sure as you proceed in the subsequent sections of this uh, course, 
you're going to hear more and more of these. Now, any name that is circulated is considered to be published, is published. Any name that is circulated is published. Okay? That's the first step. Any published name that meets the requirement of the code becomes occupied in nomenclature. I didn't want to say zoological or plan nomenclature. It becomes occupied. Okay? If it fails to meet this requirement, if the name is published, but fails to meet this requirement, it is an outlaw name, that is, it is unpublished, illegally published, or nomen nudum, which means simply, it is a naked name. Okay? Any occupied name that is not preoccupied by an older name of the same spelling is available. If it is preoccupied, it becomes what we call a junior homonym and is not available. Basically, if you propose a name and one finds out that that name was already used validly, yours is simply a junior homonym and will never be used as a valid name. Okay? The oldest available name is the valid or correct name unless it has been specifically set aside by any of the commissions because the commission has some of those privileges. An available, na an available name whose genus cannot be identified is a nomen dubium, otherwise a doubtful name. Nomen dubium is often also used for species that may be identifiable to genus but that are not described well enough to be separated from other members of the genus. It may be impossible to determine whether a specimen belongs to a particular group or not. That sometimes may happen, especially in case where the reference material may have been lost and will not be available for comparison. And as such, those specimens will be hanging there and will be considered to be nomina dubia. Now at this point, I hope that we've provided you with the basis for start or for planning how to name organisms if you happen to have, to have some that were considered to be new, or at least to seek the right assistance so that you don't publish wrongly and you see your own description eventually getting superseded by another one that came much later you probably be complaining on how people who have more means can achieve certain things, but you will probably have yourself also to blame a little because nobody expects you to know all this, but you can seek the assistance of people who can help. So we're looking forward to seeing many of you uh, publishing new stuff, and hopefully from the field campaign you're about to start in a couple of days, new material could come up and we hope to hear that they would have been uh, validly published. I thank you for listening. Questions for Dr. Fulton. Yes, please. Um, thank you so very much for your presentation. I learned a lot, but I just have a worry uh, as far as the naming of um, new species concerned as per the authors. So let me assume that um, about four or five researchers, they are in the field and then they discover a new species. Right. So whose name are they going to use? Is it the leader of the research team or are they going to combine their name to name that species? I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm going to answer that and I guess people in this hall who have named new species will make contributions, okay? okay. But I want you to understand that uh, you're going to be in the field in a couple of days you're going to be a number of you trainees and I would say scientists, and there's going to be a large crowd of porters and uh, guides and all that, okay? Do you assume or do you expect them to eventually be part of the scientific work that has been, uh, that will be performed in the work, in, in the field? Not exactly, okay? But everybody who makes a scientific contribution that is significant in research 
is acknowledged as an author. Okay? And there are some descriptions that have tens of authors. Okay? Provided that they have contributed to the work. In every project, often we have two key authors that are known a lead author and a senior author. Okay? A lead author sometimes is the young either graduate student or early career scientist that does all, if we're in the lab, the bench work or the field work, okay? And we have a senior author who is sometimes is the head of the team who has designed all the work, sometimes has found the resources, and eventually, when everybody is putting up, is writing up, he oversees the whole process, okay? They are often acknowledged, either, uh, well, the lead author carrying the first name on the publication, and the senior author carrying the last name and the correspondence also being the author for correspondence. Some may accumulate both, okay? Yeah, it may so happen that the person plays both roles, okay? And everybody would be acknowledged to the tune of their contribution to that work. I don't know if Town wants to say something more, or Dave, or 